The Unshackled Waves, episode 207. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now, apologies for episodes being so light lately and being produced. It's been a very busy end to the year here at The Unshackled, but it's all for the long-term benefit of what we do here, so stay tuned. Federal Parliament wrapped up for the year this week with our politics having a somewhat shambolic conclusion. Scott Morrison had to deal with some strange interventions from former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and his son Alex. Despite both parties agreeing that religious schools should not be able to discriminate against gay students, they could not agree on the exact legislation before year's end, as they promised. The Morrison government shut down the House of Representatives early to stop Labor and the Greens passing legislation to mandate asylum seekers be flown from our offshore centres for medical treatment here in Australia, but it still managed to pass its legislation allowing authorities access to encrypted messaging services. So to summarise the end of year in Australian politics and on this very warm day around Australia, I'm joined by who else? but the political editor of The Unshackled, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. It's good to be back, Tim. And as I said in my introduction, what a, a chaotic, uh, shambolic uh, end to the, the parliamentary year. And of course, it wasn't helped by other external factors. <laughs> Malcolm Turnbull. Oh, that's an understatement. Chaotic is an understatement. Your little cough was um, nowhere near as blatant as it should have been let's call a spade a spade malcolm turnbull has decided to go all scorched earth on the liberal party it's like the sport little kid who has taken his ball and bat and gone home because he didn't want to play anymore and now in addition to that he's just burning everything around him and everyone around him to the point where even his supporters are starting to question his um his capacity, which says something. Well, it wasn't just uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, going into meltdown, it was his whole family, because we saw some extraordinary activity on social media from his son, Alex. Oh, but oh, but, oh, but yeah. let's start with, well, who is a somebody, which is Malcolm Turnbull. He still was the Prime Minister for three years. He posted on his Facebook page for the first time since being deposed as Prime Minister, uh, demanding that the Liberal branch in the seat of Hughes get a vote on Craig Kelly's pre-selection. Now, Craig Kelly is an outspoken Liberal backbencher on energy policy. He was outspoken against the, the NEG and he supported Peter Dutton in the leadership uh, spills. And it was so weird that he, uh, he he didn't bother to post anything during the Wentworth by-election, said he was retired from politics, yet his first one is about this internal Liberal Party process. And it, that happened on the Sunday night, and it was re really quite, if, you, if you're going to come back on s social media as an ex-Prime Minister, shouldn't it be about something, I mean, to do with your, your legacy or a political matter? Mm, it should be. But because Craig Kelly was one of the biggest um, crusaders, if you like, or is, rather, one of the biggest crusaders against the idea of combating anthrogenic climate change. So it makes sense that as an opponent of Turnbull and Turnbull's obsession with global coordination in regards to combating the bogeyman of anthrogenic climate change, that Turnbull would hate his guts. So, of course, he's going to try and interfere in the election, saying, no, you know, everyone should have a free vote. Yes, like everyone in Wentworth had a free vote with all your branch stacks in 2004. Yeah, you really want to go down that path, buddy? Go right ahead. The thing is, the post that he made majorly backfired on him. Yeah. Majorly backfired. Even his supporters and the executive were like, wait, what the hell are you doing? No, nah, buggy you, mate. We're not doing this. We're doing it our way. So they re-endorsed all the sitting members, and Turnbull looks like looked like a fool. He was embarrassed by it. In some cases, you could actually say he was even humiliated by it. Even Tony Abbott did not suffer such a such a humiliation or embarrassment in the first few 
first few months after he left office, after he was turfed out unceremoniously. But you have to remember that Turnbull's never been politically smart, so if he'd kept his mouth shut, then maybe there would have been a branch pre-selection for Craig Kelly, but because he came out as a ex-Prime Minister demanding things be done that way, the New South Wales State Executive, which <laughs> they're not arch-conservatives themselves, uh, mm -hmm. they accepted the directive of uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison to re-endorse all sitting members. Mm, indeed, indeed. And it has also had the potential to embarrass Scott Morrison as well. So ScoMo said, no, we're making this call for the sake of stability. We've already had enough chaos and instability in the ranks. We need to, at least for this election, we need to confirm our incumbent members. I mean, the problem is, in theory, what Turnbull did say in his post is technically correct. If you remember the Liberal Party within an FDC, sorry, Federal Division Council, you should have the right to have a say on whom you pre-select. But the problem is he didn't do it for as a general, he didn't do it as a general thing. He d picked specifically on Craig Kelly, which people saw it for what it was, a petty, spiteful, vindictive attempt to take revenge and lash out at the conservatives and people he blamed for his own incompetence as leader of the Liberal Party and indeed as Prime Minister. But wait, there was more. Uh, that was Sunday night on Monday morning. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull went on uh, Fran Kelly on the ABC, of course, one of his favourite journalists and networks for that matter, saying that it was my intention and or Scott Morrison's intention to go to an election uh, in March uh, because uh, it would have been before the, the New South Wales state election and so they wouldn't have copped a backlash against the federal government, which makes no sense because why would Malcolm Turnbull go to an early election to basically <laughs> take take a loss to prop up uh, Gladys Berejiklian who would go to the polls three weeks later, it was going to be on March 2, March 23. And then, and then he said that um, oh, the reason Scott Morrison's going to go in May because he's moved the budget to, to April so he can go in May is because he wanted to keep his ass on uh, C1. Uh, wasn't that what you <laughs> would do as well, Malcolm? Wouldn't you want to be Prime Minister for as long as possible? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I just have to laugh and, you know, call it unprofessional. But come on, honestly, the gaslighting and projection from Turnbull against his... His pick, Let, let's be clear here, ScoMo was his pick just despite Dutton and also despite Bishop, funny enough. And, you know, and ScoMo's, I would say ScoMo's been the hand that fed him, but ScoMo certainly turned around and said, basically, I'm going to run the country my way. I'm going to lead the Liberal Party my way. And I'm going to ensure that I can do as well as I can. And, you know, I'm a little bit more sympathetic to ScoMo than Turnbull, obviously, as you very well know. But, you know, he needs to have the time to establish himself and have a chance. Because if he, if he did go to an election in March, he would lose. New South Wales would lose as well. I mean, the Liberal Party's probably stuffed in New South Wales anyway, but they would be categorically destroyed if they went and had two elections, one a state, one federal, in the month of March. I mean, it'd be fine for me, because I put a bet down that there'd be a March election anyway, ironically. But the thing is, if ScoMo is to have a chance at winning, spoiler alert, he doesn't have a chance at winning at this point, I'm sad to say, he would want to go as long as he could. He would want to go until until may actually he could technically go until june but that would be difficult because then you'd have to have a separate half senate election and that would be rather inconvenient he could still go in june but yeah it doesn't give much time to count the senate votes uh before uh they take their seats on july 1 because we remember in 2013 they lost a thousand votes and had to have a, a re-election but that's a uh side issue but yeah 
then <laughs> things got even more crazy on the Monday night with Turnbull's son, Alex Turnbull, who's a, a hedge fund manager who lives in Singapore, but nobody knew that Malcolm Turnbull had a son when he was Prime Minister, but they do now. Uh, he did a video during the Wentworth by-election urging uh, a vote against the, the Liberal Party because they'd been taken over by the, the crazy uh, right wing. And uh, it was uh, revealed that he donated, or well, he said that he donated $500 to Sleeping Giants Oz, which is this Twitter lobby account, which tries to get uh, advertisers to, to boycott uh, conservative news outlets such as uh, Sky News. Uh, their slogan is, we don't want racism, sexism, and bigotry to be profitable. Uh, they were one of the groups that got uh, Ross Cameron fired from Sky News. They have been somewhat... Uh, effective and then uh, this uh, story was uh, retweeted by Janet Albertson who's a columnist with the Australian saying that you have to laugh at how much of a caricature uh, Alex Turnbull has become and uh, Alex Turnbull replies uh, almost as funny as having sex with Michael Kroger because uh, Michael Kroger was Janet Albertson's partner for uh, quite a while now going after a female journalist's sex life, I mean, that's pretty crass. And uh, a left-wing journalist was the first one to call him out on this, uh, Latika Burke, saying, what's this got to do with anything? And then yeah. Alex Turnbull decided... Stacked to, down over it as yeah, well. Alex Turnbull decided to apologise and delete the tweet, but it just shows how oh, unhinged oh, he is. And basically, I mean... Scott Morrison tried to say Alex Turnbull is his own man, but it's but it's clear that he represents the the Turnbull family's anger at bitterness at Malcolm being uh, turfed out as prime minister. Mm, mm, mm. You can imagine that what Scott said publicly is very different to what he's thinking privately. You could probably imagine scummo losing his temper in private and wanting heads to roll. So don't be too surprised if especially after this last stunt that Malcolm Turnbull pulled the other night, if the, I think it was the Roseville branch in Sydney moved a motion to expel the Yes, Turnbull. that was a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Don't be surprised if that does eventually get carried at um, Federal Council the same way it was to the motion the Labor Party was carried to disavow Mark Latham altogether. But Mark but Latham he, was never a Prime Minister. That was... That's no, but he difference. was a Labour Party leader. And the thing is, the Labour Party generally reveres its own, at least publicly, except to the point where, what was it, Richo, I think it was? Graham Richardson referred to him as the King Rat, which mm. is kind of funny coming from Richo, <laughs> but you never know. He, um, he also said that uh, Malcolm Turnbull should be offered life membership of the Labour Party for his services. Well, Richo should have given him life membership in the 1990s when Turnbull started snaking around asking for a safe senate spot <laughs> <laughs> uh, richard probably thinks that what's happened now is uh has been more beneficial to the labor party mm, yeah well can you imagine turnbull as a labor prime minister oh, 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 oh dear <laughs> And of course, but, uh, uh, yeah, the next day, Turnbull was still not on, uh, not done. He decided to appear at the New South Wales Smart Energy Conference, where he uh, reaffirmed his support for the National Energy Guarantee, saying he was going to get get it through the Parliament. And we have to remember that the the neg is now Labor Party policy. Uh, the negative energy gimmick. Uh, how I've missed talking about that like a hole in the head. See. Of course, Labor is going to adopt one of Turnbull's policies. I mean, that's just expected. I mean, Turnbull adopted the the ETS scheme and then lost his leadership over it back in 2009. Only very narrowly, mind you, but he lost that. And so Labor, Labor is returning the favour now. <laughs> the problem with the Labor Party taking on the policy of the NEG, the Negative Energy Gimmick, sorry, I should call it by its proper name, the National Energy Guarantee, put in inverted commas, is that they can reshape it however they like. And Turnbull, while he is narcissistic and 
inconsiderate, utterly inconsiderate of, of other people. He is not stupid. He is not going to implement his agenda for, you know, integration into the um, for globalist integration carelessly. The thing is, now that Labor's got a hold of it, they are going to push it up, especially with pressure from the Greens on their left. So if the Labor Party thinks it's a win, it's not. It's really not. And you knew Turnbull was really out of control when uh, even his most prominent supporters, both in the, the party and the media, Craig Laundie told Turnbull to, to shut up and Nicky Sava <laughs> wrote that he's trashing his legacy and burning uh, bridges, which is uh, coincidentally... Uh, Malcolm Turnbull was photographed with uh, uh, Dave Sharma uh, last night, uh, saying he he he'll still make a great uh, member for Wentworth. And it's sort of like, well, it would have been good a couple of months ago, but better late than never, since Dave Sharma is going to run again for Wentworth at the federal election. Mm, mm, mm. But then again, Karen Phelps is still going to retain her high profile. The fact that she won, the fact that she won a safe liberal seat which has been in Liberal Party hands for more than half a century, had been, rather, in Liberal Party hands for more than half a century, that she's going to run on that. The Labor Party, of course, is going to preference her over the Liberals. I mean, wouldn't you? Everyone is going to preference Phelps over Sharma simply because of the fact that she is not a Liberal and they want to keep the Liberals out. They want to win. Labor wants to win at all costs they would if one nation ran they would probably preference one nation above the liberals just to spite them similar to what the liberals did in 2010 preferencing the greens above labor which was the most horrendous decision ever made by anyone in the federal liberal party but i digress um you're completely right tim the fact that they didn't Sorry, the fact that Turnbull did not give Sharma any support whatsoever is abhorrent. And now he's saying, oh, yeah, no, he's going to be a great, well, you should have, great candidate. You should have said that before. You know, he lost. He lost to someone who had no political, for, formal political experience. I mean, she was a lobbyist, but that's not formal political experience as such. She lost, he lost to her. He lost to a middle class medical lobbyist and GP who has a good community profile and has done a lot of community work in her past, but has no political experience formally speaking. And yet, as a result, because of that loss, she now has the profile to absolutely hold that seat until she chooses to retire, unless the Liberals pour millions of dollars into Wentworth, which they won't do because Turnbull's no longer the member. It's just gonna it's just gonna you're gonna keep you're gonna see Karen Phelps in the next House of Representatives. Mark my words. Now let's move on to the final parliamentary sitting week. So uh, we had uh, when the Ruddick report into religious freedom was leaked during the Wentworth uh, by-election and suggested that schools, if they don't uh, allow gay students in, the, in this school, that should be disclosed. Now this caused a huge backlash in the the, the media and so uh, Scott Morrison, despite the fact that he is a, a Christian, a social conservative, wanted to protect religious freedoms, was one of the people who lobbied for, for this report, sa uh, said, well, this was in the midst of the Wentworth by-election, which had the highest proportion of LGBT people in the country, that he would uh, pass legislation to protect gay students from being expelled and discriminated against. And they tried to well, they say that, oh, well, it was Labor that uh, when they passed the, the laws in 2013, they left this loophole in, like Labor, they're the, the real homophobes, which I thought was funny. 
Labor and the Coalition could not come to uh, an agreement on uh, what form this legislation uh, would take, uh, because uh, what the, the Morrison government proposed was that uh, schools still be allowed to have teaching activity and rules that uphold their uh, faith and, and ethos. Labor and the, the LGBT lobbyists believe that oh, this is a backdoor to to further uh, discrimination against uh, LGBT students and they're also pushing for uh, gay teachers to be uh, protected. So, and there's also disagreements in the, the Morrison government it, itself because the, the, the social conservatives, they've already conceded uh, same-sex marriage. This was supposed to be their, their, the compromise within the, the, the party for uh, having, well, once the, the postal survey came back as a yes, have this review to look at ways of strengthening religious protection, but now it seems to be going in the, the opposite uh, direction. And so Morrison's torn between the, the social conservatives in his party saying, well, hang on, this wasn't part of the deal. And Labor uh, also trying to wedge them as well, saying, well, we don't want any more uh, loopholes for discrimination. The way that the Labor Party wants to implement these laws, they want to implement the, these protections for kids, for gay kids. They want to put them in a package that also stifles and represses religious freedom that's another issue because if you are in labor you don't want your religious schools being allowed to teach their their faith or their ethos and you saw that case in hap that case or something similar to that in tasmania when uh the archbishop julian porteous of hobart the catholic archbishop of hobart julian porteous he authorized the dissemination of a leaflet nothing homophobic about it at all just a leaflet that was saying this is what we believe this is our catholic ethos he got dragged before was it the human rights commission or was it some other kangaroo court uh, he got dragged a before. tasmanian anti-discrimination tribunal one of the state-based bodies Ah, oh, so it's one of the state-based ones. Okay. Point is, he's dragged before a kangaroo court, even though what he said was not only completely consistent with Catholic doctrine, but also nothing homophobic at all about it. I mean, people just want to see if people just want to see, you know, boogeyman's of homophobia and bigotry everywhere, and they just want to be offended. It's ridiculous. It's disgusting. Like, you know, there are so many more things that are offensive than people saying what they believe hard enough and then why i mentioned the whole packaging of protections for gay students in schools with you know repression of religious freedoms and religious teachings it's almost i wouldn't go, go as far as to say it's orwellian but it's certainly very concerning when you have religious schools not being able to employ not being allowed to deny employment to people who do not share their ethos when you do not have religious schools allowed to teach their ethos and their faith and so forth and so forth it, it, it's just a massive problem and the package would be very very detrimental to civil liberties as well that's another thing that's well, at least the way that labor wants to do it and the coalition proposal seems to be somewhat sensible i mean you'll have your hardline conservatives will say they've sold that scomo is sold out but you know You've got to be pragmatic about these things as well. Well, a lot Labor and the LGBT people are alleging that if even if schools lose the power to expel uh, gay students, which there hasn't been a case that is pointed to of a Christian school uh, d doing that, they'll, they'll still uh, be able to teach that uh, being gay uh, is immoral and therefore make a gay student feel uncomfortable, unwelcome, feel uh, victimized, and so that might be another way to uh, force them out, even though that also ha hasn't happened. This is tricky because if you've got, if your pair, if you've come out as a high schooler, if you've come out as gay to your family and to your parents and they've accepted it, unfortunately, there are a lot of um, there are still, even now, a lot of families who struggle to accept the revelation that their child is, in fact, gay. And it's sad because the child then feels alienated because the parents don't know how to handle it. 
but I digress. My point is this, in the cases where they do accept um, their child regardless of their sexual preference, they are then in an awkward position. Say they go to a devout uh, Christian school. Say their parents are devout, let's, let's say, if devout Christian parents say, look, we love you regardless, we understand, we accept you regardless, they then have the dilemma. Do they keep that kid in the schools where they're teaching that acting on, not the tendencies themselves, but the acting on said tendencies is a problem? Then you've got to look at the discretion of the parents as well as the school. Uh, the parents as well as the schools in question. It's it's a very complicated issue, like we discussed back in October. So it's 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 still very problematic, and you know I don't know how to I don't know how I feel about it. To be honest, I just don't want the labor proposal because the labor pr proposal will end up incorporating further. Um, further restrictions on religious freedom. I mean, they've tried it in several states. You know, religious schools are no longer allowed to hire, are no longer allowed to deny employment to people who are contrary to the ethos. So, for example, you can be a... So, basically, if you're a Satanist and you want to work at a at an Anglican school, they, under the Labour proposals that were mercifully defeated... They'd have to employ that sadness if he or she was the best qualified. Now, Scott Morrison, to try and keep his promise of uh, dealing with this before the, the end of the year, proposed a conscience vote on the uh, coalition uh, legislation and challenged the Labour Party to have a conscience vote as well, and therefore uh, people... Uh, backbenchers could propose amendments and therefore the eventual uh, legislation would be the result of uh, individual MPs, how they shape it. So, so therefore uh, Morrison can basically avoid the, the conflict in his party saying you can just vote your conscience. But Labour Party doesn't have conscience votes on LGBT issues anymore. They were going to uh, bind their uh, MPs to, to vote for same-sex marriage in the, the next parliament. They only have conscience votes on life and death issues now. So Labor said, well, we're not going to have a conscience vote because we don't support discrimination uh, against uh, children. But I think Labor uh, didn't match this because, well, they don't want the, also the humiliation of um, conservative Labor uh, MPs like Jacinda Collins and Helen Polly uh, voting down uh, the, uh, uh, these protections. Uh, so, and they also want to keep wedging the coalition on uh, LGBT issues because they allowed uh, same-sex marriage to be passed under a coalition government and Malcolm Turnbull took credit for it. And so they don't want the coalition to get credit for this and for them to blame Labor for introducing the discrimination in the first place. So Labor, they want, well, there's only six months to an election. And so well, they, they reckon that they can hold out on this until the election and then they can pass uh, protections for uh, gay students and they can claim the credit and saying, see, our, our protections are much tougher than what those uh, homophobic uh, coalition uh, MPs would have wanted. Ah, but that's that's a danger as well for them because if they do stifle this, the coalition can not only turn it around on them and say, "Hey, we offered you a compromise; you refused to accept. Thus, you're not fit to govern." It will also bring out legitimate homophobes, legitimate bigots, and they will manage to whip up enough hatred to encourage people to vote for the Liberal National Coalition over the Labor Party. I mean, you've got to remember, there are a lot of Labour voters who are still old school Labour, still very socially conservative. Even if they're economically left wing, they're still very socially conservative. They're more um, Arthur Caldwell than um, Kevin Rudd, put it that way. So it's a, it's a danger for them to do that. I mean, I mean, granted, it would be very hard for Labour to lose this election because of the fact that the Liberal Party is 
well, it's basically done and dusted in terms of holding on. I mean, there's only unless actually what's got actually we won't discuss what Skyman needs to do to win, but that can be an entirely different episode. But the thing is, it's a risk for Shorten not to play ball. If he does play ball with the coalition and, and accepts their compromise, then he won't be able to uh, be attacked later on for refusing to cooperate with good governance or sensible policy. If he holds off and tries to make it an election issue, he risks the, his um, his intransigence being used against him. Now, it's been widely noted that uh, next year the federal parliament only sits for eight days before the election, and uh, <laughs> most commentators have said, or oh, now that the Morrison government is in minority, uh, well, they lost Wentworth, Julia Banks is now on the, the crossbench, they only hold 74 out of 150 seats, and this week proved that they've clearly lost control of the policy agenda. It makes Julia Gillard's uh, minority government look uh, strong and stable. And Labor and the Greens, they've tried to pass a, a bill to that would mandate that children uh, can be flown over from uh, Manus Island and Nauru for uh, medical treatment here uh, in Australia. Now, of course, this would significantly undermine uh, our border security because there, uh, because once anyone arrives here in Australia for medical treatment from an offshore centre, they're never going back. It's because uh, they'll appeal and uh, the, the refugee lawyers, they're, they're always itching for, for these type of uh, cases. And there's only 10 children left on Nauru anyway. And the Morrison government, they uh, this is the second time they've done this. They suspended the, the house to avoid uh, defeat, uh, which... Well, <laughs> When you do that, it, 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 it's basically a panic move, like, oh shit, we're, we're going to be humiliated here. Quick, quick press the uh, break glass in case of emergency button to get the fire hydrant out. How could they lose it, though? I mean, yeah, okay, yes, it's true, they only have 74 out of 150 seats, but it was Julia Banks and... Was Julia Banks going to vote with the Labor and the Greens? Well, she's already uh, said that she wants the children off Nauru. She said that in a speech. And given that she's independent now, um, if she said that, she's probably going to vote for that. That perfidious wench. I'm sorry. Banks annoys me no end. Always has. But um, this is the thing that gets to me. Notwithstanding the government's incompetence in... Maybe not so much in comments, it's just farcical travesty in suspending the House to avoid a defeat on this motion. <laughs> How many... We've got medical professionals on Nauru. The Nauru government have medical professionals. We've got medical professionals. They're basically walking around on Nauru relatively comfortable people have even started businesses over there people have been repatriated to nauru have even started we're torturing them don't you know oh we're torturing them so you know the government's paying for my smokes the government's paying me for money to buy food the government is paying me to you know be enterprising and start up a little business the government is paying me to go to america which i turned down because of the fact that America's a shithole, similar to the country from whence I came. Mate, fuck off. Pardon my language, but fuck off. We're not torturing them. And then the next person who says, oh, we're torturing people on Nauru needs a good backhand. Honestly, if we were torturing people on Nauru, the Nauru government would protest about it. The South Pacific Forum would know about it. ASEAN would know about it. The EU, the UN, Every multilateral organization in the world would know about it. The Chinese would call us out for hypocrisy on in regards to human rights if we were actually torturing them. Yes, Tim, I know you were being facetious, but it bugs me when people say, oh, we're torturing people. No, we're no, we not. We're giving them a much better life than what they fled. In some cases, actually, you know, at, this, at the way things are going at the moment, they're probably going to, in six months, they're probably going to be better off in Nauru than in Australia, the way things are going. <laughs> Seriously. 
maybe I, maybe I should, you know, maybe I should fly to Indonesia, burn my passport, and then go on a rickety boat, get intercepted by the Navy, get sent to Nauru. I could live in Nauru, you know? Maybe I should do that. Now, a lot of commentators have pointed out why is Labor making such a, a big deal out of this, given that there are only 10 children on uh, Nauru, and last time they were in government, their border protection policy was a disaster. I mean, why not just let the uh, detention centres eventually empty like they did under John Howard quietly? I mean, are, are they wanting to basically, because they do have the, the same border protection policies as the coalition, uh, is this a way to sort of virtue signal to their progressive base that, uh, you know, we're still the, the compassionate people on, oh, on border it protection? It but they're playing with fire. Oh, they, they, they really are. And the people smugglers, <laughs> once Labor wins the next election, are going to be testing their resolve. Well, of course it is. It's just, a, it's a virtue signal and it's something that they'll change anyway. They'll say, you know what? We were heartless. We're going to go back to the old way. Yay. So we're going to get more people who are fleeing for their lives, drowning at sea because of negligence on the part of the Australian government under labor. Yeah, that's not what I want. I don't want that. Nobody wants to see people drowning. No one wants to see that unless you're a pathological sadist in which case you should be in a padded cell but seriously though even in our even in our federal parliament i don't think i could genuinely find someone who genuinely wants to see people drowning but that's what's going to happen that's what's going to happen if labor gets back in and makes a, does a one-up on their current virtue signaling i mean you said that did you say i'm sorry Let's go back a bit. Did you say there were 10 children left on Nauru? Only yes. 10? Yeah. Only 10 children. Hmm. And are they protected by parents or are they wards of the state? I would say that they, they came with their parents. So they've got their parents there. So in ideal circumstances, the best providers and nurturers of children. Okay, so... And Nauru has a hospital. Yes, of course Nauru has a hospital. Maybe not the most expensive has hospital. Has Australian doctors there? Yeah, there's Australian doctors there. Which means they're already getting much better healthcare than the people of Nauru themselves. The actual indigenous people of Nauru. Now, with the Morrison government shutting down the House of Representatives uh, to, to stop the uh, medical transfer of, of asylum seekers being passed, that they'd sacrifice their encryption laws or uh, de-encryption laws. It's called the Assistance and Access Bill, which would allow uh, federal uh, criminal and surveillance authorities uh, access to uh, encrypted messages on apps such as WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, uh, Wicca, because the government and the authorities believe that these encrypted messaging services are the, the new way that uh, terrorists are planning their attacks. Mm -hmm. In they look honestly, Tim, they may be correct in their assessment that criminals are using encrypted message services such as um, uh, WhatsApp, the Signal, and others to plot their dirty deeds. However, this is something that's very important and something that's often overlooked in the argument about the de-encryption laws, the decryption laws rather, and it's this. The assistance and access bill that has been brought before the House, which was being debated vigorously last week, um, and the Labor refused to pass it at first because they said, no, we don't like this bill. We have, we have concerns about it. The coalition then called them un-Australian and unpatriotic. You know. They said they were running a protection racket for the, the terrorists. Well, it is the Labor Party, so that's not entirely inaccurate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but so I'm sure on this matter, it's not their intention. No, look, look, it's not their intention. Obviously, it's not their intention. I was being facetious before when I made that snarky comment. But the problem with the proposed laws is not that they won't work to stop criminals in their tracks. It's that criminals will figure out other ways to get around 
the the laws. What you're asking for, well, sorry, what the government is asking for is a master key to break the encryption on any and all encrypted message carriage services. The problem is though, at the moment, and I was talking about this with a colleague of mine uh, a week or two ago, because he asked me what my opinion was on it. And I said to him, I don't know. I'm, I think it's a good thing on the basis of, you know, being able to combat terrorism more quickly and general crime more quickly. On the other hand, I am worried about the slide towards a big brother 1984 Orwellian regime. And what my friend pointed out to me is that out of all the evidence that is used in discovery, only 2% of it or so comes from text messages or phone conversations. So if you do actually pass these laws, you're actually undoing decades of counter-terrorism, counter-espionage, and, and uh, what's the word for combating crime? Anti well, let's call it anti-RICO because I'm forgetting the, my brain's forgotten the Australian equivalent at the moment. You're actually going to set it back 50 odd years. And if that happens, then criminals will once again have a new advantage over law enforcement because they'll find other ways. At the moment, without the decryption in place, criminals are stupid. They'll slip up. They'll, they'll instead of talking on WhatsApp or Signal or whatever, at or dis, even Discord, instead of talking on those, communicating on those, they will sometimes slip up and just make a phone call or a text message and then you'll be able to figure out that way. If you de-encrypt it, or sorry, if you decrypt it with a master cipher key, then you're end going to end up having new programs being created, which is good for the enterprise and good for the IT industry, but it's also bad for law enforcement. Yeah, these are always, uh, when these laws are passed, it's always just basically law enforcement wanting more power, what they believe will make their, their jobs easier. But as you mentioned... It's actually going to shoot them in the foot, though. That's the thing. This is what my friend was saying. It's actually going to shoot them in the foot. Because it's not actually the police themselves that want it. It's the politicians that want it. The police who are involved in counter-espionage, counter-terrorism, etc. They are... Well, I would say they're happy with the current arrangements, obviously, but they are able to work with the current arrangements in as much as criminals will slip up. They'll make a phone call on an unsecured line or, or a non-encrypted carriage service, and they will use that as a way to put them under surveillance. I mean, there's already enough surveillance on criminals as it is argument. And the thing is, as well, I mean, we were actually discussing off camera before, I should probably clarify for our listeners and viewers, uh, last week what happened was the article that you wrote, Tim, uh, pointing out that less than 20 minutes after the Department of Home Affairs confirmed its denial of Gavin McInnes's visa to enter Australia in February, the ABC was able to, the ABC was tipped off, was able to fact check this information submit it for editorial approval and then publish it all that in 20 minutes 20 minutes after the decision was handed down so before um penthouse australia who uh who took over the milo tour were even aware of it themselves you know this is a major embarrassment major embarrassment and you know the home affairs department wants this power and they can't even give their own own house in order respectfully peter you need to get your department in order. That's what it comes down to. And the fact that they have had this embarrassing and egregious leak just goes to show these laws probably won't do anything about transparency. They certainly won't do anything about privacy. 
Uh, well, there's always one rule for for government, and then one rule for the the rest of us. There was that famous mm -hmm. uh, meme of uh, Hillary Clinton saying, "Silly Americans, laws are for poor people." Because let's not remember <laughs> these uh, politicians have been using these encrypted messaging services to well bring down prime ministers. I mean, Malcolm Turnbull, Julie Bishop, and BBC WhatsApp and and Wicca to 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 plot their various uh, schemes. So it's yeah, of course Sammy's it's. Secure. It's owned by Facebook. WhatsApp isn't even secure. Who uses WhatsApp anymore? I mean, if you're going to plot something, you're not going to use WhatsApp unless you're absolutely retarded. Well, the, the WhatsApp chats that politicians have been having have found their way into the newspapers now. So I don't, I don't think that the politicians will be using that one. They'll, they'll probably go to Wicker, Signal or Telegram. Yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, I've never used WhatsApp, partly because Facebook owns it, partly because I've never seen the need to use WhatsApp. I don't have the need for encrypted communications as such, I because everything I say, I say out in the open, generally. So oh, do nothing I, wrong, you've got nothing to worry about. Well, yeah, <laughs> ironically. Um, no, I have a lot to worry about, but not because, of, not because of what I write in my text messages, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, look, these laws... They've got, they come from a place of good intentions, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I know I don't need to convince you of that, but there are probably some people who are still asking the questions why, as to why we should not support these decryption laws. And what yeah. it comes down to is not just a matter of privacy, it's also a matter of ensuring that we do not turn into an Orwellian dystopia as melodramatic as that might sound it's true i mean it only starts it starts little by little one day you have no freedom left and mm. it uh, shows that the the liberal party is nowhere near embracing uh libertarianism i saw, saw quite a few uh libertarians this week when these uh laws were being passed gloating that i oh, changed from the inside how's that how's that going <laughs> uh, because basically, <laughs> Labor this week, and we have to give uh, Shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus credit for uh, amending the legislation that it's only for terrorism and organised crime that uh, these law enforcement agencies will be able to uh, gain access to encrypted messaging services. So we have to be thankful that Labor still, well, <laughs> they may not like free speech, they still uh, respect the, the right to... Uh, privacy and yeah as you as you're mentioning this isn't the first time that our civil liberty has been chipped away in the name of anti-terrorism remember the metadata retention laws remember they were going to stop terrorist uh, activities and it's always thought that this is going to be the one that the, th this will be the last encroachment on our civil liberties that we'll, we'll need. But now there's this new one, uh, encrypted messaging service. So they're, they're going to come up with another one in six months or in the next couple of years that, oh, we're going to need access to this uh, new uh, technology to keep us safe. Oh, count on it. Count on it. You see, this one, one of the beautiful and also very scary things about the internet is that it can't be governed, it can't be controlled as such. It, it's, but what you were saying before, Tim, it's like, a, you know, just this should be the last time, this will be the last time. What is this, a John Farnham tour? <laughs> is this, it is, it's just like the alcoholic who says, oh, I'll just have one more drink, just one more drink, just one more drink, or a gambling addict who says, just one more flur, flur, um, fluster, just one more, one more bet, one more one more spin of the wheel, whatever you want to call it, whatever analogy you want to use. That is what this is. Actually, I quite like the John Farnham last time tour analogy. I quite like, I think I'll use that from now on. Well, I think that so, this is going to be the Morrison government's last time. <laughs> it should be. I mean, I wish it weren't so, but it should be. I mean, the Morrison government, look, the Liberal Party left it too little, too late to roll Turnbull. And, you know, I'm, I weep for our country, Tim, but that's for another episode. It was actually, I think, one of only Scott Morrison's actual policy legislative achievements in his time as 
Prime Minister, there's not much substance. And some people are saying that the fact he got this passed and got Labor to basically buckle on this shows he had a strategic victory. But I don't think it's going to matter in the long term. This is going to be forgotten in the in the new year. There's going to be continuing warring between the moderate and conservative factions of the Liberal Party. Bill Shorten and Labor is still in the box seat. So yeah, small victory, but yeah, like more like tiny victory. I mean, this, yeah. <laughs> they, they, there's not much they can do to turn this around. It's going to take a miracle. Yes. Good policy to rebuild the country would be a start, but heaven forbid that our betters do what's actually good for the country. Well, Michael, um, I've appreciated you joining me on this uh, hot day, both here in Melbourne and in, in Brisbane. Uh, I'll just fill, fill our viewers and listeners in that we can't have our air conditioners on when we're recording because they make too much noise. So we've actually had to record this. We've had to add air conditioning breaks uh, throughout the, the recording of this episode just to basically cool off. Indeed. Well, hopefully it um, cools down soon. There do seem to be some clouds in the sky, so maybe we'll get a nice cool change up here. Well, let's go off to get cool now. Thanks again, Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Now, another spanner in the works has been thrown at the Deplorables Tour, now being held in February 2019 with Gavin McGuinness last Friday evening. He was denied a visa uh, to be part of the tour by the Home Affairs Department. The promoter Penthouse Australia has called for an Australian Federal Police investigation, given that the ABC reported the visa denial before Penthouse themselves knew. It's a long shot to overturn the denial on due process grounds, but Penthouse is not giving up. Tommy Robinson, who is also part of the tour, has so far not applied for a visa, but given his criminal convictions, his chances of obtaining one are just as difficult. Marlene Nopolis has joined the tour as well. He was originally going to be touring with Ann Coulter this December with Australian Events Media. However, this was cancelled and since then he's had a very public falling out with the promoters of that company, Dan and Ben Spiller, who have released sensitive business and personal information related to the tour. Despite all this, Penthouse are still billing all three names for the tour dates. I know ticket holders have been frustrated, so hang in there. Check your email for further updates from Penthouse, and any further changes will be reflected on the tour website at thedeplorables.com.au. Okay, so one tour we are hoping there won't be a leftist or any other campaign to sabotage is Dr. Jordan B. Peterson's return to Australia, also in February 2019, with special guest Dave Rubin of The Rubin Report. He will be visiting all the major cities, including Canberra, as well as Auckland and Christchurch in New Zealand. Good news, limited tickets still remain, but they won't last long, so go to jordanbpeterson.com slash events as soon as possible. Our online store, Upright Market, is doing a roaring trade with our new range of products, such as our It's Not Okay To Be Green shirt. Make sure you check it out by going to uprightmarket.com. Remember, we are only able to keep up our production schedule with your support here at The Unshackled. And of course, the best form of support is becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Or there is the option to send us a direct one-off contribution via our PayPal link at paypal.me slash The Unshackled. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.